We will uh, jump right into it. I I'll just give a short uh, intro. Uh, in Alaska, it's not unusual for us to understand the need and easily put into practice an attitude of neighborly cooperation with Russia, with Canada, with uh, practically anybody because we are so far removed. Alaska is less than three miles from Russia, if you can imagine that. We share a common heritage, indigenous connections, and a common seaway that requires cooperation. The Bering Straits holds many opportunities for partnership, including economic, oil spill response, search and rescue, ship traffic, uh, monitoring, a network of ports, air transportation, potentially a future tunnel and railway, research, subnational collaboration, seaway management, minerals development, environmental conservation, wildlife fisheries and waterfowl management, and national strategic collaboration. Oh, and my favorite subject that I forgot is subsistence and food security. So there are a lot of issues that uh, we share in common with our neighbors across the way and our, our neighbors to the east of us. And many of these issues will uh, be touched on by our panelists today. And so without uh, me saying much more, I'll go right ahead and uh, you've already had the introduction, so I'll just turn the microphone over to Gail. And we have a, about five minutes uh, of time for presentations from each of our, our participants. Sorry. Good afternoon. I think we're uh, the last panel between you and um, something cool to drink, so we'll uh, move it right along. This is the mission of the Bering Straits Native Corporation. We're still subsistence-based communities, and we support economic development, but we also realize that we need to protect our land and resources as well. Nome is our largest community, and uh, you heard mention of it earlier as one of uh, two Arctic, uh, possible Arctic port sites. This is our region. We have 17 villages in our region, and um, I am from Yinlaklit, which is the village, if you look at the map there, it looks like a nose, and kind of right here on the map is uh, where I was born and raised. I mentioned that subsistence is a really important activity, and these are just some of the things that our uh, folks engage in um, during our subsistence activities. And the picture on the bottom is a picture of my village, Yunlikli. This map shows how uh, close one of our communities is to Russia. It's only two and a half miles um, in distance, and the international date line separates uh, Big Diomede, which is Russian, from Little Diomede, which is one of our member communities. Here's another map of the uh, region. The Seward Peninsula is uh, what is largely recognized as the area that um, encompasses our member villages. You all have seen this map before, and it shows the two trade routes. Um, the uh, Northern Sea Route and also the Northwest Passage. And, but I think more importantly, if you look at where the two lines uh, go down, I'm not sure how to use this. Is there a pointer there? In any event, the two lines on the uh, far right there going down, uh, those two lines go right through the Bering Strait itself. And this sh shows basically how strategic our region is in terms of what's happening in the north, in the Arctic, and um, our, our region. So Russia is right next door to us. Um, this is a photo from Little Diomede, our, one of our member communities, and Big Diomede. And I talked to some folks on Little Diomede the other day and um, asked if they had seen any sort of Russian activity. Um, because, you know, on a clear day, they can actually see, <clears throat> excuse me, Russian soldiers sitting, uh, standing on the cliffs uh, back there. And one thing that they said is that they have constructed a large antenna that they can see over the cliffs. And um, they are not inclined to go over there. But in the 40s, about 52 of the uh, folks from Little Diomede went over on a customary visit and they were uh, detained, I think, for about six months um, and uh, questioned repeatedly because um, they were thought to be spies. 
So about five years ago, um, when I uh, put this slide together, it was kind of tongue in cheek. Um, but it seems lately uh, there really has been a lot more chatter about the fact that Russia thinks it got a raw deal uh, selling Alaska uh, to the US for two cents an acre. Um, and um, one of the things that has also been noted is that uh, Russia really has stepped up military activity in the Arctic despite what they say. Um, Russia began restoring its military uh, capability and infrastructure um, in the Arctic in 2012. And basically the Defense Ministry is building or restoring facilities on the continent and the Arctic island from Franz Joseph Land to the Bering Strait. In recent years, Russia has unveiled a new Arctic command, four new Arctic Brigade combat teams, 14 new operational airfields, 16 deep water ports, and 40 icebreakers with an, with an additional 11 in development. And as Admiral Zimkov said earlier, we have two icebreakers. One is uh, functional, and it's my understanding, um, at least as of April, that the other was um, not, not really functional. So it's really clear, in my opinion, that Russia is militariz militarizing the Arctic, irrespective of what they, they say. <clears throat> I'm going to run through some slides and not uh, discuss some things because of time. Um, so Russia has assured us that most of uh, the capabilities that they're building up in the Arctic have only defensive application and often serve dual purpose purposes in supporting other government objectives, such as enabling resource development, supporting shipping along the northern sea route, or contributing to Russia's broader search and rescue capability. They also assert that none of these, these developments present a real threat to Canada or the North American Arctic. They assure us that construction of a new dock at an Arctic military installation is needed because the existing facilities are not big enough for the giant nuclear icebreakers that are coming off the production line. And so you hear all this activity going on in Russia and you ask, well, what are we doing? Um, the first thing that I would note is that Congress is looking at cutting $54 billion from its budget. But there are a lot of national security concerns that the U.S. has to deal with. And uh, those include strategic ports in the Arctic, missile defense because of North Korea and other countries, icebreakers, and we also need to ensure freedom of the seas in the Arctic, as well as telecom and domain awareness. The Coast Guard said earlier that they need uh, six icebreakers to cover responsibilities at the North and South Poles, and they cost a billion dollars to build. Build. And Senator Sullivan, speaking before the Alaska Federation of Natives in 2017, said, Russia has super highways, but we have dirt roads with potholes. Unfortunately, I think that's uh, largely true. This uh, map behind me shows Port Clarence, and it's uh, an area of, uh, that has been described as a natural deep water harbor. And recently, we were um, allowed to, Bering Straits Native Corporation was allowed to um, proceed with its claim of about 2,000 acres at Port Clarence. And um, so we're hopeful that as the Arctic continues to develop and as infrastructure continues to develop, that um, it's one of the areas that will be considered for a port facility of some sort. Um, one of the earlier Russian presenters said that because of U.S. sanctions and restrictions, U.S. investment community won't be able to partake in most of the Russian major projects. And what I'd like to say is that we're open for business and we'd welcome your investment dollars. Very and good. those conclude my uh, remarks. <clears throat> Very good, thank you, and I, I think that that's something that's uh, not thought about enough, and that is while we continue to hope for and think about a, a peaceful Arctic and, uh, and the fact that those of us in Alaska who are neighbors to some potential conflict, we don't want to see that conflict either, but the, the perspective by many of us is that we shouldn't be completely
completely defenseless, and and many of us feel as if that that uh, we've we've ignored our, our defensive situation a little too much, and it isn't as if we want to be aggressive. In fact, Alaska appreciates a good relationship with Russia. We would like to continue a good relationship with Russia, but at the same time, uh, we, we sort of hold to the concept of a, of a nice picket fence between neighbors. Uh, we'll keep their dog on their side and it'll keep our dog on our side. But Alaska is not moving in that direction uh, very quickly uh, and very much at all. And so with that, uh, why don't we go ahead and go right to Bill. Okay, thank you very much. Um, not every day in the District of Columbia that one is surrounded by Alaskans when you're on a panel. <laughs> so this is a, a special privilege. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be here and I want to congratulate both the Woodrow Wilson Center and, and the Arctic Circle for uh, bringing this meeting together. It's very important. Uh, I actually had the privilege of being a, a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center uh, several, many decades ago now and uh, know the great work uh, that, that that center does, and, uh, and, and my boss, Carter Roberts from WWF, uh, has been very active uh, with, with Alice for, in, in, from the beginning of helping to pull together the Arctic Circle, so I, I'm glad to be here. Um, WWF has had a, a long presence in the Arctic. Uh, we, we've carried out work uh, in the region, and across the region for more than 25 years. Uh, we are an observer uh, before the Arctic Council and very actively participate in both the work of the Council and its subsidiary bodies. And we are uh, present in every Arctic country through national organizations uh, that are grounded in those countries except for uh, Iceland. and. Uh, don't know whether if the tourist business continues to grow or uh, other activities in Iceland, maybe we'll eventually get a presence in, in Iceland. I think it's really important that we are, in a sense, ending the day with a focus on the Bering Straits, um, because that, that is where, as you've heard, uh, literally uh, uh, Russia and the United States uh, look at each other across this important but very small expanse of water. And as you pointed out, uh, I just want to make two points about the Bering Straits, significance beyond that geopolitical one, which is uh, economically extraordinarily important. Uh, all of the shipping routes that you can imagine springing out across the rest of the Arctic Ocean all go uh, between those two islands that you had the pictures of. So uh, that's important. Also, uh, the straits are extraordinarily important from a biological viewpoint. Uh, the migration of uh, uh, bird life, sea life, uh, other species um, is extraordinarily important there. And that's both biologically, from an ecosystem function viewpoint, critical, but it's also central, as you will undoubtedly hear from uh, my colleagues, to the maintenance of, of the subsistence uh, way of life that is so important uh, to the people of the Arctic. So this, this, we can look at the Bering Straits and it's sort of a microcosm of how are the countries of the Arctic doing in providing what we heard this morning is so essential to the future wise use, sustainable development of the Arctic, um, which is that there be stability, that there be the rule of law, and that there be good governance as the platform for that future s sustainability. So the question I want to, at least from my perspective, close the day with is, well, how have the U.S. and Russia been doing uh, at cooperation to bring about uh, those, those features uh, that are so essential. First of all, there's a long tradition uh, of cooperation. It's been informal for thousands of years between the people of the region. More recently, uh, there have been agreements between the governments to resolve border conflicts. There have been uh, uh, agreements between the governments uh, to provide special uh, management of resources, such as polar bears, 
there have been agreements on uh, oil spill prevention and response, and uh, in, in another area, in other areas, it was mentioned this morning, uh, conservation and particularly protected areas. There's been a lot of talk there, but not much coordinated action. So that's between the two countries. Um, if you look at the, what they've done with, with inside of the Arctic Council, sort of collaboratively with the other Arctic uh, uh, countries, uh, there, there's been recent, as has been mentioned, uh, action by the collective countries of the Arctic, search and res rescue agreement, an agreement on black carbon uh, reduction, which hasn't been mentioned before, uh, and the most recent agreement on science and research, as well as on oil spill pollution and prevention. So there's a, a long history of both bilateral and, uh, and, and multilateral agreement. But I guess the question I want to focus on as I conclude is, well, what's the case going forward? And I think there's uh, grounds for concern. Um, there's a history of good cooperation between the Coast Guard of the two countries, but that's, that's, that's in a holding pattern right now. One of the things WWF has tried to do is to at least continue to stimulate conversations uh, between the two Coast Guards uh, in order to keep uh, uh, communications going and discussion about issues. The most recent of those meetings that you heard reference to this morning had to do uh, with uh, assessing uh, the spill in the Gulf uh, with Russians in Russia, in Moscow, with U.S. experts involved in that effort. So we've tried to help keep that communication going. Um, but there are areas where we could do a lot better. The Coast Guard right now is beginning to come up with a plan, has come up with a plan for routing and areas to be avoided. That should really be seamlessly connected to a similar plan on the Russian side, and both countries should be taking that and advocating that to the IMO. That's not happening. We did a scorecard at WWF on how the Arctic countries are doing overall in implementing their recommendations that they make at the ministerial level of the Arctic Council. We released that scorecard at the ministerial meeting in Fairbanks uh, uh, in April, and quite frankly, the countries, most of them, are not doing a very good job on most issues in terms of actually implementing programs in their countries at the local level, at the state level, that implement those ministerial decisions. So there has to be uh, improvement in that regard. And even where decisions have been taken, uh, such as the adoption of the Polar Code, uh, one wonders whether the Crystal Serenity is compliant with uh, the requirements that uh, now exist as of January. So our perspective at WWF is that if you look at that microcosm of the Bering Straits, and then you look at the context of the decisions, there's a, there's a lot that still needs to be done. Some areas that, and I'll close with these thoughts, for moving forward uh, between the two countries are enhanced work on uh, spill response. Uh, you heard reference uh, to some of those uh, issues uh, earlier in the afternoon. Uh, I mentioned the issue of uh, more coordination across uh, the boundary between the two countries on ship management. Um, I think that there is real room for progress in the area of uh, special management of critically important marine areas, particularly. The Russian side is doing a very good job on that uh, effort. I, I think there's been less progress on the uh, American side. And then I think, uh, uh, finally, uh, there might need to be some strengthened mechanisms in the Arctic Council to see that the very excellent policy recommendations and the very excellent science work that gets done, actually then there is follow-up and implementation uh, by, uh, uh, by the, the governments at, at the appropriate level, whether it's state, federal, or even uh, more local. Conclude by saying that the re recent meeting on Arctic dialogue in Russia, uh, President Putin uh, fairly affirmatively spoke to these issues um, and his remarks. And I think um, 
that perhaps the meeting between uh, President uh, Trump and President Putin that w is, is in the offing in the future would offer an opportunity for uh, President Trump to, to join, and we, we, we would see a, a convergence of strengthening that coordination between uh, the two countries. Thank you. Thank you. I think one of the interesting things that came out of the, the conference in Arkhangelsk was the, uh, the invitation, was it by Finland, that, uh, where they invited uh, President Trump and President Putin to go to Finland and actually have a, an Arctic conference to talk about the future of the Arctic. So I think that, that is a good idea. Of course, I'd like to be in the room as well. <laughs> Not sure that'll, that'll happen, but uh, one of the things that, because of the incredible, incredibly strategic and societal and uh, ecological and economic important of, importance of the region that we're talking about, it, it's critically important for Alaskans to be involved, and so I'm happy to be part of this panel and to, to see the folks here. And this is an area that we need to continue to make sure that we're involved in to be now, especially at the, at the national level, in helping to set policy and Im implement policy because these are our waters, this is our air, these are our wildlife resources, these are our people that you're talking about. And any federal uh, law or, or agreement with another country should, uh, in my opinion, uh, make its way through Alaska so we can have a look at it and make sure that, uh, that it's done in a way that's inclusive of the people of Alaska because, as other speakers have said before, there would be no Arctic in the United States were it not for Alaska, so we have to be involved. All right, the next uh, speaker we have is Melanie. Thank you, Craig. Um, and I'd like to thank the Wilson Center and the Arctic Circle, uh, Mike Sfrega, President Grimson, the Honorable Jane Harmon, and Alice Rogoff for allowing me to be here um, and present with you today to offer my perspectives on the topic of the U.S. and Russia in the Arctic. To our wonderful, esteemed audience um, from all sectors, from all countries, um, although uh, English is my second language, I'm, my first language is Yupik, Siberian Yupik, Kuyakamsi. I also did take a little bit of Russian in college, so to the Russians, uh, and of course to um, our Americans, hello and welcome. <laughs> um, my Yupik name is I'm Melanie Banky. I come from the island um, that you call St. Lawrence Island. Uh, it was on the map earlier that Gail showed. If you think about how it looks physically, um, our name for it is Sivokak, which means wrung out. Um, so I know my people were mapping well before um, Google Maps came around because it does look like it was wrung out. Um, we share the same heritage as uh, indigenous people on the Chukotkin side, our fellow brothers and sisters um, in the Chukotkin region. And I know it's been a long day. Um, humor is one of our cultural values. I'm not a best joke teller, but I'll try. Um, anytime I speak, I try to question my own qualifications. When you look at all of the speakers, they have, uh, they're very qualified, so I was questioning my own uh, legitimacy of being on this panel, and then I realized to put a spin on uh, Sarah Palin's take on it, um, the Russians can see my house where I live. <laughs> More seriously though, um, I offer a human lens from our region. I uh, am a mother, sister, wife of people who live in the Arctic. My brothers are bowhead whalers. Um, in St. Lawrence Island, we do come from a long line of people who have lived and thrived in the Arctic for thousands of years uh, before it was the latest hot topic. We were the first environmentalists, we were the first participants in commerce, any sector, you name it, we were the first to be there present in the Arctic. I'm also the leader of COERC, um, which is the tribal consortium in our region. We have 20 federally recognized tribes, 7,500 people living there, and 75% of our population is indigenous. We are ground zero for all things Arctic. Our organization builds infrastructure, we provide social services, we facilitate economic development, we're engaged in research, you name it, all sectors, we're there. Um, we also facilitate U.S.-Russia cooperation. We have a bilateral agreement for walrus mon monitoring, research and information sharing, so we're very engaged. Um, 
We do share, I mentioned, with our Russian uh, indigenous brothers and sisters thousands of years of history, language, culture. Um, to put this from a human lens, I want you all to think of the closest person that you're related to, your closest relation. And imagine um, if all of a sudden one day somebody waved a geopolitical wand and you could not communicate, you were cut off from that person. Um, that is basically what happened to us um, during the Cold War when the Iron Curtain dropped. And um, we don't want to see a repeat of that. I, I realize that there are tensions right now with the US and Russia. Um, but we talk about industry and environment and um, government, all these different sectors, but things need to be viewed from a human lens. We rely on the air, land, and sea for our survival, very literally. And now that we are reconnected, we do not want a repeat of um, what happened during the Cold War and being cut off from literally our relatives and our relations. As indigenous people, we are subject to the political winds of our two superpower nations of which we are citizens. And I want um, this to be at the forefront. If I could set a gold standard, today the Norwegian par parliamentarian, par parliamentarian, and I hope I don't mutilate his name because uh, although I took some Russian and Spanish, speak Yupik and some English, I've not learned Norwegian. I think his name was Eirik Syverstein. He said in their nation they are putting the people of the Arctic first in all of their considerations. I view this as a gold standard from a human lens perspective. Um, our human bonds and our human rights shouldn't be placed second to any special sector, whether it's uh, natural resources, state rights, um, national rights, industry rights, animal rights, um, human rights need to be considered first and foremost. We don't want to become an endangered species. Uh, this is the second wave of westernization, and so as Honorable Jane Harmon said, this time we can get it right. There are um, very real challenges and opportunities, and that was what I was asked to speak about. This panel is asked to speak about the challenges and responsibilities and opportunities in the Bering Strait region. In our region, we've got five villages in imminent danger. Because of uh, climate change erosion, um, there's a need for mitigation, so that's a challenge. We speak of ports and icebreakers. One of the challenges in our region is that we still have basic needs lacking, such as water and sewer and housing. Um, we have management of our natural resources. We'd like to see co-management be more of an opportunity. We have social issues. These are some challenges. Mm -hmm. Maritime security is a challenge. Um, the lack of oil spill response, disaster preparation, that's a challenge, that's a real challenge. But what are the opportunities? I think there are opportunities. Um, you mentioned, many people mention it today, the Arctic is um, a neutral zone for US and Russia to come together. And not just, I think, our political forces, but all sectors, if uh, the researchers are working together, if um, industry is talking to one another, I think um, both of our countries will benefit. Those of us who live in the Arctic, we don't want to be passed up um, when it comes to opportunities, you heard some um, discussion about ecotourism as a very real opportunity. We don't want to be standing on the shorelines while everybody else is benefiting uh, commercially from the opportunities in the Arctic. We live in the Arctic and we should be benefiting from the opportunities. We're um, at most risk for all of the activity that's going on. That's my time to stop for myself. Otherwise, I could go on and on. <laughs> Um, I do think that we have a lot to offer um, to um, our hunters, our first observers. Um, we've got thousands of years of observation. Um, we can be contributing to research, um, infrastructure development. Um, in our region, the tribes support the need for a port system being put in place, um, securing our borders. There was, uh, Megan asked a question earlier about our Alas Alaska Territorial Guard, Alaska National Guard, reinvigorating that. Our um, young men and women stand ready and they want to participate. We want to take ownership, responsibility, and participate in the opportunities in the Bering Strait region. Um, I'd, invite, I'd like to invite you all to hold your next dialogue in Alaska. Um, I mentioned I t also took a little bit of Spanish and they would say muy caliente here in Washington, D.C. with 91 degree weather that we're speaking about the Arctic. 
Um, <laughs> so I'll just end with that. Um, for all sectors, don't put us at the back of the bus. Don't consider us secondary. We want to be engaged in policy making, um, stepping up for the responsibilities and benefiting from the opportunities. We have been in the Arctic for thousands of years and we intend to remain for thousands more years to come. So let's get it right this time. Igamsi kayu vikamsi, thank you, spasiba, gracias. Oh, Melanie, I really appreciate the, the concept of the gold standard, and I often think that, especially in the Arctic, that our people are used in this great tug of war, and we had the, the previous administration wanting to focus only on climate issues. A current administration is focusing on infrastructure and oil and gas development, and so we're constantly stuck in this middle, and I really like the idea that uh, that you're presenting here to, to keep uh, the people as the gold standard and, and considering the needs of the people because it is all encompassing as, as you've talked about and as many other people have talked about that we live in this environment where we have to be environmentalists and we have to use the natural resources around us to survive. So it's a very good message, a good takeaway. And with that, I'll turn it over to Paul. Thank you. Um, this, for, uh, for quite a few years, I worked as an industrial and emergency response diver in the Arctic. So this is what the uh, Arctic looks like from under the water. It's beautiful and it's clean and we want to keep it that way, that's for sure. So what we saw here from the marine exchange, we do the vessel tracking in Alaska. This is what the traffic looked like in 2016 across the Bering Strait. And you can see it's a pretty active area. And uh, as the Admiral said, the, the concern there is about prevention. And he did mention lack of infrastructure, and that's true, but I just want to point out that even if you have the best infrastructure and all the best oil spill response recovery equipment, what do you think is considered a really successful cleanup? How much of the oil? 10% would be the highest. Actually, the historical record's about 5% for cleaning up spilled oil. That's it. So in the Arctic, that would be a disaster for us. I mean, the index species are marine mammals. They have to live near the surface. They're highly vulnerable to the oil. It's also the baseline of food security for the Arctic. So uh, the other thing in terms of the traffic that we expect to happen, we heard a lot here about sea ice extent over and over. It may not be the most important factor. Actually, the most important factor is sea ice thickness. And the historical uh, record has been about two meters, you know, average uh, multi-year ice. We're down to about a meter and a half now. So, you know, sea ice extent, you get down below a meter of ice, and that's nothing to an icebreaker. In fact, uh, thin ice is actually the preferred easiest method because you don't have waves and storms and everything else. So, you know, once we get down uh, below a meter of ice, you're going to see uh, much more year-round operations in the Arctic. So how do we know this? Well, we have put up antennas to receive the signal from these ships, and every ship is required to have AIS, Automated Identification System. Puts out a signal every six seconds, it's accurate to three meters. So within 10 feet, we know where these ships are. So this is our coverage uh, of the Bering Strait, and I'd say again, uh, unlike Sarah Palin, we actually can see Russia from, <laughs> from where we are, but we see it electronically. So this provides a basis for really a, a type of a, a management system that, that uh, you, know, you referred to here, where uh, on the American side, uh, you know, what we do well, actually, I'd just say that's part of a bigger system for us. We've put up 130 receiving stations around the whole state, and this is what the traffic looks like. This is one day in Alaska, the vessel traffic going by, and you'll see the great circle route. You know, one of the lessons of the Arctic, a lot of times we don't reach economies of scale. We provide those tracking services to all those vessels also on the great circle route, 7,000 trips a year. There are about 450 trips through the Arctic. It wasn't economic to do it for the Arctic itself, but it is if you combine the whole thing together. And we are actively managing an area here of about four million square kilometers. It's the largest and most complex vessel tracking and management system in the world. And we have a 24 by seven uh, monitoring. Uh, and so these guys are constantly looking what's going on. We have an algorithm in the system. If vessel slows down below three knots, the assumption is, is that it has a problem. 
So we're calling them, what's the problem? Uh, and sometimes, well, we're just reballasting our tanks, it's okay, but other times my engine has quit, I need this part. Where is the next nearest vessel that can respond? It probably isn't even a Coast Guard vessel or a government vessel, it's a nearby commercial vessel. It's the nearest vessel that can help save uh, these guys. So we have offshore routing, they have to stay far enough offshore so we have enough time if they have a, uh, an emergency that we can respond. It's similar to the agreement that Russia and Norway have together when they uh, uh, delineated their border and agreed for how they would ship crude oil in that area. Another concern in the Bering Strait is about two thirds of the volume of the car cargo there now is petroleum products. So this presents a pretty high risk operation. So the other thing that we can do here is we can do digital fencing and we can, what we did here for Shell when they operated, we had whaling in this area, this shaded area next to the shore and they didn't want to bother the whalers. So uh, they agreed that we'd put this fence there and that their ships wouldn't go in there. Well it displays on the ship's display and we're able to monitor it. Uh, the local people are able to monitor it, and, and actually during Shell's whole operation they didn't violate it. I want to point this out because it gives us the capability for dynamic areas to be avoided. Problem is you could go in and say, oh, the walruses are here last year, let's make that a marine protected area. Well, the next year they're somewhere else. So we can actually dynamically you know, provide this protection and then remove it and remove the restrictions on shipping you know, if, if you can, uh, you know, if it's, not, if it's no longer necessary. So, uh, you know, from this, our proposal is that we would establish a joint managed seaway with Russia. And these are the tracks that, the, uh, that Admiral Zukunk uh, re uh, referred to that we're looking on the U.S. side. The Russians should have the same side. Uh, our proposal is that we jointly manage this area. We've actually made the make the invitation to Russia to have a couple of their Ministry of Transport officials come and sit right next to our officials in our command center. You know, AIS is a public signal. Anybody can see it and it ought to be able to be used internationally to manage this traffic. So uh, it would require a bilateral agreement, something that, uh, you know, our former Lieutenant Governor is working on this St. Lawrence Seaway is a way, you know, one way to approach it, uh, form our side of it and the, with the Northern Sea Route Administration. Uh, Russia could implement it under Section 234 of the Law of the Sea Treaty, which allows nations to put special provisions in an ice-laden waters. And because we haven't passed the Law of the Sea Treaty in the U.S., we don't have that available to us. That's why we really need to work through these international uh, uh, agreements. And if it turns out that because of objections for, for, the, for freedom of the sea, Department of Defense or whatever, then we need to go to the International Maritime Organization and make this part of the Polar Code. You know, th this is the reason why casualties are happening, either equipment failures, but more than often it's human error. And when our guys see it, they're, they're outside of the channel where they need to be, they call them, you need to get back on, on, on straight, you're in the wrong channel. It's not deep enough, you're gonna have an accident. And you know what, none of those ships ever complain. It's like the airline pilot, he's not gonna complain that the, the air tra traffic control tower, or you're just about to land on the wrong runway, or you're just about to run into another plane. You know, these guys are out in the middle of the nowhere and they appreciate it. So anyway, it's not onerous, it can be done. Uh, I do wanna mention again, Taro Veraste here, the uh, Arctic Economic Council, and for all of you working in the Arctic, I think you really need to watch this group and appreciate the work that they're doing because this is the uh, private sector coming to the table in a very responsible way to say, yes, we're going to operate there commercially, but we're going to do it in an environmentally responsible way. So they actually support the standardization and harmonization of these regulations because it makes it easier for the ship to operate. You know what it is. You don't go, I go one kilometer difference, I got a whole completely different set of rules. That doesn't work. So I think there's you know, a lot of room for cooperation there. Uh, you know, Canada, we're talking the same thing, you know, with them and, you know, if we agree to these bilaterally, we don't have to argue about whose sovereign waters they are. We're saying these are the minimum standards you're going to operate by to have safe Arctic shipping. So anyway, that's my presentation. That's how you'd, uh, you know, get a hold of me if you want to. Uh, we'd be glad to speak to uh, any of you about this and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. So that leaves us with about uh, 10 minutes for questions if folks would like to line up. And while folks are lining up, I'd actually like to throw one out there and maybe this is for Paul, but others could probably answer it. 
And that is, I have a concern that because of our lack of funding, lack of infrastructure, and, and it seems like a lack of will, that if the U.S. doesn't get more serious about the Arctic, about the bearing in particular, that uh, as ship traffic increases through the Straits, that we'll lose out on, on an important opportunity to lead a seaway management type of a program, uh, perhaps because the, the Russians will be more capable. And so I, I don't know if that's a legitimate concern. Is it legitimate? Is it something that I shouldn't be worrying about? All is well? I mean, it, you have a great presentation, and I've, I've heard it several times, and every time I love what I'm hearing, but I'm still concerned. Well, you know, we, we look a lot at what the Russians have done. And as I look at it, I really don't look the, at them as offensive capabilities. They're really more like logistic support. These are small units. They're cross-training their people in how to do oil spill response and emergency response. Uh, they're putting in emergency response centers. They've just, uh, uh, this last year, launched three salvage uh, emergency response vessels, which are uh, basically for their Coast Guard, which have firefighting capability, oil spill response capability, towing capability, helicopter search and res uh, response capability. Our own Coast Guard vessels don't have that. The last time we retrofitted our uh, icebreaker, we took all the towing gear off it. I don't know what the uh, design for the new icebreaker is going to be, but it better have at least that capability so that it can, you know, render assistance to, to a vessel that's, uh, that's in trouble. Uh, I don't fault the Russians for what they're doing. They're just occupying their own space, and I just wish that our own country would do the same. So what you're saying is I should worry. I have a right to worry. <laughs> All right, I'm going to worry. All right, uh, we'll go ahead and take the question. Lady on the left, please. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Mindy Reiser. I'm vice president of an NGO called Global Peace Services USA. I'm sorry I missed a good part of the conference, but I've been here for about two hours, and it's been illuminating. What I don't understand very clearly is the opportunity of the peoples who have a shared heritage going back millennia to visit each other. We're talking about two different countries, United States and Russia. And it's not clear to me what obstacles there are, what possibilities, do they need to get visas? Could, could you clarify this? I gather in USSR times, this was uh, not simple at all, maybe impossible. What happened when the Soviet Union imploded? This would be 1991. Through now, if you could walk me back a little bit over this period and where things stand, that would be helpful. I'll take a stab at that. I'm uh, no expert um, other than locally what I do know. Um, so following the friendship flight that they mentioned earlier, 1988, that lifted um, the ability for us to go back and forth. Um, and currently, if you're an indigenous person, you can travel visa-free over to Chukotka to visit your relatives. There are two communities that um, we have very strong ties to over there. Um, so visa-free travel is a current reality, and what I was saying was I want that to be maintained, that we're seeing these political tensions, we read about them in the news um, right now, um, indigenous people can travel back and forth by um, boats, umiaks, when the weather permits, or through uh, Bering Air, um, which <coughs> flies commercial charter flights back and forth. It's an hour-long flight. Th does anybody monitor that on the Russian side? Do they ask for any documents? Or they yes, you have to have an invitation. You have to document that you have an invitation and a place to stay, and both sides monitor uh, the visa-free travel. You have to apply for visa-free travel. I would just caution, though, that if you have a Russian surname, you should be careful about going over, uh, because I have a um, former client who went over on one of those freedom flights, and uh, she had a Russian surname, and they were not going to let her leave on the flight. They actually had to hold the flight on the ground, um, because you know they were damned if they were going to leave her there. Um, she couldn't speak a word of Russian. She had a U.S. passport on her, um, but because she had a Russian surname, they were convinced that she was trying to escape the country. Um, there definitely are still um, challenges. Not uh, about maybe a decade ago, um, there was a boatload full of Russians who had to return by a certain deadline per their government, and 
Um, even though the weather conditions were not ideal at all for traveling and everybody told them not to go, they had to meet that deadline and all people on board that uh, skin boat perished. Um, and then just last year we had somebody from Savunga um, sort of stranded over in Russia for a period of time and he made the national news um, trying to get back to the U.S. So there are challenges um, and it's been through the U.S. government's um, cultural exchange grants um, through, for example, the um, Beringia program within the Park Service that we're able to go back and forth. Can I add to that question? Is it uh, the same for uh, Aleut people and, and others that live along the coast? Because I haven't heard of of easy transportation back and forth for those folks. Do you yes, know? yes, they can. They, they can. they can go to the Komandorsky Islands. The Aleuts can visit each other uh, visa-free as well. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I'm Russell King. I'll direct, direct this to Ms. Schubert or, or whoever would like to answer. But there's an international maritime boundary that goes through the Bering Straits, roughly north and south. And there are certain islands to the west of that um, boundary in the Russian area that at some time since 1867, the Elastic Purchase have been under U.S. control. I think Wrangell and Jeanette are two of them. Can you tell me the history of these islands? Have they changed uh, control from the United States to Russia or back at any time in, this, in the history? Can you t tell me, give me a historical pr perspective of that? A, histori a historian here might know more than I do, but you know, I'm, my knowledge is uh, mainly based on the two islands that are in our region, the Big Diomede and Little Diomede and uh, the history there where uh, traditionally the, the folks uh, typically went back and forth uh, fairly consistently because there were only two and a half miles that separated them. And um, now when folks from Little Diomede, for example, go out to subsist, they have to be really cognizant of where that date line is um, because if they accidentally stray into uh, Russian waters, uh, you know, they said that sometimes there are vessels that kind of start to come out toward them. Um, but they also said that occasionally, I think it might be bearing air, um, might um, stray over Russian airspace between the two islands and, um, and do it kind of to see if there's a reaction. <laughs> Typically there isn't. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I think that um, what was traditionally done, um, you know, many decades ago is, is something that unfortunately really no longer happens as consi consistently as it did. Does anybody have any just specifically on Wrangell right? Island? Some explorers went there, and on that basis, some people feel it ought to be claimed as U.S. But really, the assumption is that it's Russian, and they've recently built a small base there. So I don't think anything's going to happen with those islands. <laughs> Not anytime soon. Okay, uh, we have a couple minutes, so I'll take just these two questions. Hi, I'm Debbie Atek. I'm a Bering Straits uh, shareholder, and this question is uh, specifically for Gail. Uh, when I was visiting Alaska recently, a friend of mine was uh, able to pick up the business to turn around the Crystal Serenity um, cruise that visited uh, Nome. Uh, they told me that they got that business because nobody locally was able to fulfill the insurance requirements for that cruise line. Uh, I also understand that the Crystal Serenity schedule is up for next year, and currently they're not scheduled to do that uh, tour again uh, through the North Sea so do you know in the future, have you guys been talking to the Crystal Serenity line? Do you have any plans to help local vendors to meet any of the insurance requirements? Or maybe this question is better uh, for Melanie. I'm just curious about how, how you're going to help local business owners prepare for the next visit from uh, the Serenity. There actually will be other cruises that come through Nome. Um, and, you know, I was just having a conversation earlier with Alice about some things that can be done locally in Nome to enhance the, the visits of folks who come off those uh, vessels. Um, you know, we have in, in the Bering Straits region, Pilgrim Hot Springs, which is a natural, natural um, hot spring. If any of you ever make it to Nome, you really need to try to get out to Pilgrim Hot Springs. You have to get a permit to go out there. Um, but it's an incredibly beautiful area and uh, we just rebuilt the hot spring itself so you can you know go in there and sit with your your family and everything and just the vistas around are uh, just breathtaking um, but you know it's 
I, I think that it, it's a good idea to build that kind of infrastructure and, and promote it in Nome, and that's something that we are certainly going to look more into. Thanks, Debbie. Um, I'll just add to that, Gail. Um, Coerc and Bering Straits Native Corporation work very closely when we have um, areas where we're in alignment, and definitely I mentioned um, ecotourism as an opportunity. Um, under the Obama administration, um, we were able to secure what's called an Economic Development Assessment Team grant um, through USDA. We were able to bring our people together and have them identify what they felt were economic opportunities. And definitely tourism is one of the um, highlighted areas where our people, our leaders said that we need to put some focus on. So at Coerc, we've been doing some training on how to be a tour guide. Um, we have five actual cruise ships that are coming through this season. Crystal Serenity, we hear about the most because it's the biggest one, but there are five that are stopping in Nome. Um, Kawark also brings our local native artists in um, from the villages so that they can participate in um, you know, the commerce that happens from having the tourists in place. One of the things that we're um, grappling with right now, though, is the ivory ban. Um, the concept of elephant ivory being um, imposed on people confuse the two. Uh, walrus ivory, we rely on walrus for um, sustenance. It's been you know, a cultural, nutritional um, food source for us for thousands of years, and I'm wearing an ivory bracelet today. But this here is illegal in five states right now here in the US as it is, so um, we've got challenges and opportunities, but ecotourism is definitely something that we're going to be focusing on. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, thank you very much. i just make one comment and then uh, one question uh, preceded by sharing with you an important piece of news that came out, uh, came out yesterday. My comment is that looking at what Russia is doing in the Arctic in terms of enhancing capabilities, it's very important that we understand that from a perspective of what's necessary in that huge territory and how in the 20 years following the fall of the Soviet Union, they didn't really have the economic capability to do almost anything. And thirdly, if everything that has been said here today that the US needs to do in terms of icebreakers and Coast Guard capabilities or maybe Navy capabilities, if the U.S. did all of that, uh, you could, on the other side, then say that the U.S. was engaged in a military buildup uh, in the Arctic. Uh, I think it is true what Admiral Papp said uh, two years ago, that the Russians are basically doing in the Arctic what we in the U.S. should be doing. And uh, the purpose of this forum here is to, to try to achieve that balanced uh, view. And we should not forget either that, uh, as has come out here today, about 20% of the future of the Russian economy is in the Arctic. So, of course, they need infrastructure in an area which is 20% of their economy. And in addition, it is seven time zones uh, in the Russian part of the Arctic. That's more than twice the entire United States. So by geographical definition, they will need a lot more than the U.S. needs simply in Alaska in order to have, uh, have the capabilities. Uh, this was my comment on, on this, uh, this um, conclusion of what conclusion we draw from the Russian buildup uh, in the Arctic. The important news, which I was going to share with you, which came out in China yesterday, is that for the first time now in an official policy from the Chinese government, they have redefined the one belt, one road strategy. The one belt, one road, for those of you who don't know, came out a few years ago from the Chinese government as the global communication and transport system in, for the 21st and the 22nd century, like the Silk Road was uh, in previous centuries. And up to yesterday, the Arctic sea routes were not a part of the Chinese definition of the one belt, one road, new global system. But, in, but yesterday, 
For the first time, they included the Arctic sea routes as a part of the One Belt, One Road. That is monumental news uh, for the Bering Strait, uh, for uh, our discussion about uh, infrastructure buildup and, and co-investors, because once they have defined whether it's the Northwestern Passage, the central route across the Arctic Pole or the Northeast Passage, as a part of the One Belt, One Road, their whole investment structure goes behind that. Mm. That means the One Belt, One Road Investment Fund, and that also means the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank, which the US is not a part of, alone among the uh, European North Atlantic countries, Britain, France, Germany, my own country, all the other Arctic states are part of the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank. So my question to the panel is this. In the light of China now having defined the Northern Sea Route as a part of the global One Belt, One Road system, how will that affect the uh, debate and the planning as well as the uh, views and the vision within the United States on uh, the Bering Strait and the necessary infrastructure uh, build up. If I could take the first shot at that, you know, uh, when we've talked to the Chinese, the Koreans and the Japanese, their assessment is, is that if they can ship six months out of the year, it's worth it for them to reorient their whole container trades. So we're pretty close to that now. And with this new class of Russian icebreakers, I mean, the, the, the biggest one coming out now is, is 65 megawatts. They're talking 120. That'll do 9 to 12 knots through 4 meters of ice continuous. So, you know, and then, yes, you have to pay for the icebreaker, but the cost of an escort icebreaker is less than the piracy insurance you have to buy if you're going to go <laughs> through this. Through this stra it's true. It's absolutely true. So, you know, while, once we get to that, I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make a big difference. And like I said, we do need six months a year uh, coverage for them to make it worth changing their whole supply chain management and logistics and everything like that. But once we get to that, it's, it's going to be wide open. Bill? I, I would just add uh, the thought that, uh, going back to my remarks, that the idea of stability, of governance, of the rule of law in the Arctic uh, is, is essential to be a platform for sustainable economic and social development. And I therefore think as these initiatives, such as the one as you described by China, evolve, they're going to put greater and greater pressure on the countries of the Arctic, uh, including Russia and the United States, to assure that they're providing that stability, rule of law, and uh, governance regime, and it isn't there yet uh, under the framework of the Arctic Council, but it can be, and I think the fact that the ministers and the countries over the last three meetings of the Council ministerial uh, body have adopted legally binding agreements is movement in that direction and suggests that the countries of the Arctic recognize that they need to be seen to be providing this stability if, if the economic development and social development is to take place without disasters. That might, that might be true, but let me point out to you also that there are two frameworks for this good governance and stability, in neither of which the United States is a party with all the other Arctic states. One is the law of the sea, mm -hmm. which is the internationally agreed legal framework for good governance uh, in this area. And the other is the new Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank, which all the other Arctic states except the United States are a party to. So if our aim is to establish a system of good governance and uh, responsibility in this area, especially in the light of the Chinese decision yesterday, it's imperative for the United States both to join the law of the sea, 
and the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank. Well, WWF has supported U.S. accession to the law of the sea for more than 25 years, and uh, we have some problems with our Senate. So the only thing that I think I would add is the, and maybe this is just for folks that aren't aware, but the, uh, the project that you were talking about has the potential, or maybe more than potential, the reality of serving 65% of the world's population with an investment that probably has to grow now. The initial thought was $1 trillion to, to develop this infrastructure. That's probably going to have to grow if you're, if you're including the Arctic. And uh, as Melanie said, as others have said, as many of us have long thought that if, if Alaska, the United States in particular, in terms of infrastructure development, isn't involved in some way in bringing us up so we can be prepared then all of this is going to happen around us, and we will once again, as I often say in forums like this, we'll, we'll once again, or we'll continue to be treated like a colony, and others will come and get our resources, and they'll leave us with a, a few scraps here and there, and uh, we, we won't be a part of, of this major change. So I think it's, it's critically important that we are able to participate. Of course, Alaska is a very small economy. It's difficult for us to do this on our own. So it's going to take a, a strong state, federal, uh, and public-private partnership across the spectrum. So we're looking for investors. So all of you who have some money, please invest. Invest in Alaska. And with that, I conclude. And let's uh, give an, a, a round of applause to our panelists.